this is something that you hear warnings or scare tactics that, oh, you know, you, you, and, you know, all these essential fatty acids that you supposedly can't get from a vegan diet, or if you get it, it's not absorbable. We hear all these different things. And you've done a lot of research on this. And, you know, I have some vegans that say, oh, just eat flax seeds and chia seeds, you'll get it. I have some that say, well, that's not absorbable. I have people that say the oils. I know some people that are vegan, they just eat, take fish oil. So not really vegan just for this one thing because they can't figure it out. So give us the lowdown here on on this. And you were mentioning that it, it, it could affect the cholesterol or not. So there's so much importance to this. And then finally, somebody told me about the testing of it. They uh, Some people say, oh, take there's a good test where you could test it in the blood. And somebody else says, well, that's not really an accurate test because it's in the tissue and there's no real way to unless you're taking a biopsy of the brain, you clearly can't test it. So in the blood, if it's in the blood, it's a bad thing they're saying, because that means it's not getting in the tissue. So give us the lowdown on your experience with this topic. Yeah, this is quite a controversial topic. And I think it's one of the most divisive amongst uh, the plant-based community right now, especially with some of the doctors getting in quite heated debates. Uh, you and I are both friends with Dr. Frank Sabatino. Uh, you probably are familiar with um, uh, Dr. Milton Mills, um, both of friends of mine and both of us uh, agree with uh, this line of thinking that plants are the right way to get our omega nutrition. Um, there's a couple of asterisks in there too, and I'll get to that, but let's start in the beginning. How well, you're, you're the reason why they're in agreement with that, your <laughs> yeah. research. Like if you aren't around, they might have a different opinion, but... <laughs> Well, it's a group effort for sure. Um, there's lots of uh, researchers that have contributed to this body of evidence. Uh, Professor Methrell out of the University of Toronto, uh, Professor Basnet. Uh, I mean, I could just go on with these professors that have really done segments, pieces of this puzzle. But when you put them all together, it makes for a brilliant, clear picture that human beings are herbivores. We are meant to consume omegas from their plant states. I'll explain why. Okay, so first, how did we get to this place? Well, there was a study done in Eskimos, Inuit tribes, in Alaska. They were consuming uh, fish, a lot of fish, right? And not getting heart attacks. Okay, um, that data was actually wrong. <laughs> um, they assumed that they were not getting heart attacks because they didn't report anybody dying of heart attacks. Well, they were dying of cancer and, and type 2 diabetes and other things before they got a heart attack. So it, it was negating the data. So if you just look at their data, no, they didn't die of heart attacks. Well, of course, because they were dying earlier. Their average lifespan was 35 to 50 years of age. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to do something that creates my lifespan shortened to 30 to 50 years. <laughs> Um, but that's how they misinterpreted the data. And that's how this whole fish oil idea of, of omega-3, EPA, DHA got, got started. So they looked at the omega-3s that were in fish, and they're preformed. Now, preformed means that the animal itself has already converted it to EPA or DHA, or eaten EPA and DHA directly, as in the case of fish. Fish eat other fish, and that's where they get it. But all of the EPA and DHA that they get comes from algae in the ocean. It's just passed up the food chain. The fish that eat algae get it, then fish eat the ones that eat algae, and it's just passed. But it all originates in algae. Okay, on the surface of the planet, we're not fish. We're not swimming in the water. We don't get our, our, our omegas from algae. 70 to 80%, and if you're uh, hopefully vegan like myself, 100% of our my omega-3s come from plants. Okay. Well, you can say, well, wait a minute. We've always eaten fish throughout time. No, that is not the case. We have now paleontological evidence showing that humans were almost entirely herbivores. Um, we can see that by uh, the oral microbiome. So we can take the fossilized teeth we can look at the dead DNA left by the oral microbiome, the amount of bacteria that's living in the mouth, what they were eating because it would only be supported by those bacteria. If you put starches in there, you're going to have starch eating bacteria in your mouth and those will reside on the teeth. And then we can dig up the fossilized teeth and see exactly what the human beings are eating. That was step one. Step two, they started finding fossilized human poop called caprolites. 
they found that they were consuming on all seven continents, Australia, South America, America, uh, Africa, and the Asian continents, every single caprolite that they did, 100 to 250 grams of protein of fiber per day. Now, I challenge any one of you to consume 200 grams of fiber and have any room left in your stomach to consume an animal product. It means 98 to 99% of what they were consuming was plants. Third, they went even further. They actually looked at the bones. Now, when you, everything is a carbohydrate, everything, even protein is a carbohydrate. It's just got a nitrogen molecule stuck, stuck on it. That means carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Sugar is, all fiber is, all amino acids are, they all have this carbon backbone. So when you do uh, research on bones, you can see those carbon fingerprints throughout their biology. So now we know for a fact that people in the Mediterranean area were eating almost exclusively plants. That the only reason they had animal bones in their camp is because they were capturing the animals like sheep and, 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 and cows and stuff and using them for poop, for fertilizer, to grow the plants better. They weren't eating them. They measured the sheep and bones and stuff that they found, and they all had uh, worn de uh, dentals, worn teeth. It's because they lived a long life. They weren't killed for their food. If you're going to kill an animal, you'll kill it, and it's prime. That's where you get the most meat from it. So early humans had bones animal bones left in them, but we assumed we ate them. No, we were using them for fertilizer producers so our crops would grow better. So this whole assumption that, that plant uh, humans are anything that are reversed. Okay, so back to the ALA conversation. Well, with we, what you just said, not to interrupt your train of thought, I mean, maybe you can get into this later, but some would argue that the plant food we have today is nowhere close to the nutritious plant food they had back then. It's been so denatured and most people can't even get like a fresh fruit that's just picked unripe and the grains aren't even identical to what they were back then. So continue with your train of thought, but maybe get back to that because it's like, yeah, okay, maybe they did do that back then. But with all this technology today, we're just trying to survive and, and maybe we, we don't have the same food they had back then. No doubt about that. And that's a, that's a great conversation uh, as a whole. But to can you continue this? The reason I explain that is because 70 to 100% of our omegas come from ALA that only comes from plants. Animals do not and cannot produce ALA, which is the only essential omega-3. Okay, why do I say that? Okay, so an essential nutrient means that we can't produce it ourselves, that we have to get it through our diet. It's essential for us to consume it. All right because animals don't produce it, humans included. Okay, so ALA converts to SDA, then ETA, then EPA, then DPA, then DHA. That's the five-step conversion process. Now, when early scientists said, okay, when we consume ALA, how much of it is converted down to DHA? Because we knew there were big stores of DHA in the brain. One, we assumed the brain must need a lot of DHA. We now know that that's not true. <laughs> but two, we said how much ALA is actually getting converted. So they looked in the blood. Actually, the very first and most commonly used, called the omega-3 index, measures red blood cells. So you take red blood cells out of the bloodstream through a blood draw, and you measure how much DHA is in the red blood cells. Okay. <laughs> All right, ALA does not convert to DHA in the blood. Only about 1% or less than 1% is converted to DHA in the blood. So the scientists assumed, oh, wait a minute, ALA is not going to provide enough DHA for our brains. So we must consume fish oil to get the DHA in its preformed state, formed outside of our body instead of endogenously formed DHA. So this was the wrong assumption because we were looking in the wrong place. We now know through amazing stable isotope, carbon 
data. We have traced this pathway and found that 30 to 47 times more ALA is converted to DHA in the liver. Why is that? Because if we convert ALA to DHA in the bloodstream, it can reach the heart. When it does that, DHA causes fluid permeability. It allows more water, basically, to get into the heart muscle. Now, the heart needs to be rigid so it can pump, right? It needs to be hard. If you've got something that's watery, the heart doesn't <laughs> pump very well because it's like a waterbed. You ever try pushing a waterbed? That's what you're creating when DHA causes too much fluid permeability in the heart. This is why we, our body does not convert ALA to DHA in the blood. So it won't cause this fluidity. Now, what does that fluidity do? It's called atrial fibrillation or an irregular heartbeat. So when you have an irregular heartbeat, you are 63% higher risk for having a heart attack. So this is why the body chooses ALA as a preference source so that it can control the amount of DHA being converted in the bloodstream. And our body chooses, when it gets ALA, not to convert ALA to DHA in the bloodstream so that it doesn't cause atrial fibrillation and heart attacks and strokes. That's what the body wants to do. Instead, it takes ALA to the liver and attaches, it's called LPC, lysophosphocholatine, to the DHA so that it can cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. When you take fish oil DHA, it causes atrial fibrillation. We have over a dozen studies showing it causes atrial fibrillation. So, the whole fear that you weren't getting enough DHA to the brain is, one, measured in the wrong place. It doesn't happen in the blood. It happens in the liver. The reason it doesn't happen in the blood is because the body doesn't want to put the heart at risk. By consuming preformed DHA from fish or from animals, you are forcing preformed DHA to get in there and affect the heart negatively. The body doesn't have a way to override that. You see, when you convert ALA, it goes down all the way down to the bottom before it's converted to DHA, because our body can turn on and off every single step of those enzymes to prevent conversion. It's a self-regulatory, like spouts. You're turning on the spout, turning off the spout if you want to convert it down. You want to turn it down, put a little more enzyme there, it'll convert it down. And it does that to regulate how much DHA our body produces in any particular tissue. It's because DHA can have detrimental effects when it's too high. So the body has a regulatory system in there to turn on and off these enzymes to control this. It's exactly what we see when we see humans convert, eating ALA. The body keeps it DHA out of the bloodstream so that it doesn't negatively impact our heart. Then turns it into a safe form of DHA, LPC DHA, so that our brain can use it. This is the proper pathway. By taking a DHA supplement, even from algae, you are disrupting and overriding the body's own natural regulatory process and forcing a negative situation. Would you say the same thing for EPA, same exact situation? EPA does not have that issue, and I'll explain why. EPA helps uh, lower LDL cholesterol. It helps improve cardiovascular system. So you can take all the EPA you want. But here's the catch. EPA was never an issue with ALA. ALA converts to EPA really quickly and easily in the bloodstream. Why? Because it's good for the bloodstream. It's good for our cardiovascular system. It's good for our heart. So there was never any question about ALA converting to EPA. We know it does that. And it does it really rapidly and really well. The question was, does it convert enough to DHA to feed our brain? Now we know it does. And not so, only that, yeah. the reason why it, it doesn't do it in the blood. So when people mention omega-3, they're talking about these three things, the ALA, EPA, and the DHA, correct or no? It's a little bit more complex than that. Okay. So there's actually six forms of omega-3s. So the second form from ALA to SDA, 
Okay, that first enzyme is called delta-6 desaturase. It's called the rate-limiting enzyme. All right, so if you're consuming something like flax or chia, which only has ALA, if you have what's called a polymorph genetic polymorphism, if you have a gene, you're born with it, about 20, maybe 30% of people have this gene variation that doesn't produce that first enzyme very well, you're going to have a little bit more difficulty converting the ALA from flax or chia down into the second version, SDA. Okay, so then I said, well, if that's the case, what's the richest source of SDA of any plant? Because if you can provide the human body with SDA, it bypasses that rate-limiting enzyme and then allows everybody, regardless of their genetic makeup, to get full conversion. And I found it. It's called ahi flower. <laughs> um, Buglosoides is the... Well, uh, be before we get into the ahi flower, yeah. is there a way to measure if you have that enzyme yes. or not? Yep, you can do a genetic test and find out. Uh, it's called APOE4 or FADS2, F-A-D-S2. You can uh, see which, if your genetic makeup has either of those, then you have, you may have the potential of not per, not converting ALA um, to down furthermore. Now, besides there's a couple the, ways to overcome the, that. You can consume a lot more ALA to hypercompensate for it, or you can consume something that has uh, SDA in so it. So besides the FADS2, what was the other name it is, the enzyme? APOE4. APOLE4? APOE4. Okay. APO4. APOE4. Okay. Four. okay. So, as you were saying, so now you want to compensate for that if you have that. And right. So, I was looking for a more universal one plant that everybody could take, regardless of their genetic makeup, and still get all the omegas that they want. So the richest source of SDA of any plant, non-GMO plant, obviously you can genetically modify a plant to produce more of it, but non-GMO plant is ahi flower. Buglosoides is its original plant name. Its commercial name is ahi flower. It was the very first to bring it to market. It won the Nexty Award in 2017 for best new ingredient of the year uh, out of every supplement in the entire country. Uh, I'm really proud to to bring it to market because I really wanted for even vegans to be able to meet all of their omega nutrition efficiently without having to overeat foods in order to get what they can. Now, you can just make sure you're getting a whole lot of omega-3 uh, fatty acids from ALA to super compensate for this. But when you look at the foods that are higher in that, walnuts um, and things like this, I, I wouldn't suggest eating a whole lot of walnuts or because it comes with other fats and calories. Um, so I was saying, okay. And then people ask me, well, you know, you're into whole foods. Why don't, why don't you do whole food with this? The, the plant itself is colloquial called stone seed. Um, it's because the seed is hard as a rock. It breaks your teeth if you try to bite into it. Um, so that's why the, the seed was never cultivated as a food so stuff prior to this. But now we have machinery that can break open the seeds and extract the oil, put it quickly with antioxidants into a capsule so it doesn't oxidize. And then you can have uh, the richest source of omega-3 with high amounts of SDA, the highest amount of SDA, so that everybody, regardless of your genetic makeup, can get sufficient omega-3s on a daily basis. Now, if somebody doesn't have this enzyme that's that's blocking that or, or limiting that, do they still need this? Uh, I wouldn't say need. Um, I'm, uh, for If you are monitoring your diet regularly and you're seeing and you're calculating that you're getting more than sufficient amount, we're talking about 1,200 milligrams per day of ALA. If you are getting that on a regular basis, then no, you probably don't need to supplement um, unless you have the genetic difference. Is everybody doing that on a regular basis? Most people probably are not. Um, uh, you know, 
Can it be done? Absolutely. Was it probably done in our, our past? Yes, probably likely just because the vast amount of quantity of plants we were how consuming. many how many how many did you say twelve hundred twelve hundred so the based on the calculations the two thousand and nine study uh, calculated what it would take to meet the requirements of EPA DHA and ALA in the brain and in other tissues and it calculated out to about twelve hundred milligrams a day of ALA slightly less than that if you are consuming any plant like hemp. Hemp actually has some SDA in it. Um, so hemp is a good source uh, if you want to do it in the whole food. Um, ahi flour just has about eight to 10 times more SDA in it than hemp does. Going back to the, the conversions of the oils and everything else, uh, where, did, where does the EPA fit into that? Is that lower? So EPA is not really a concern because uh, ALA converts readily and 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 rapidly to to EPA. So and that's, that's never been a concern. And now people getting the L uh, A L A from a vegan standpoint, you got the walnuts, the chia seeds, the hemp seeds, and the flax seeds are the most common known ones that have the ALA, right? Yeah. Just a caveat: just like flax, chia should be ground. They did a study on people consuming whole chia and found that they got no increase in omega-3 whatsoever, zero. Even if it's uh, soaked? Even if it's soaked, because when you soak it, it creates a gel outside of it, which where you get uh, chia pudding from, right? Sure. And that gel protects it from being digested. So it passes through the system whole, just like a, a kernel of corn. Have you ever- so The chia should be before? ground. Chia should be That's ground. An important point. Like That's an extremely important point for people to- to get so now, if the chia is ground, just like flax seeds that are ground, you would use it the same way: ground the chia and then just sprinkling on a salad or something. Correct. Uh, and I suggest grinding it and then immediately consuming it because as soon as you grind it, you expose the oils to oxygen, which can oxidize. What about ground flax seeds? Is if you're buying that from the store, the powder is that uh, an issue? Get yourself a little coffee grinder. Uh, it takes two seconds. You just put your flax, your chia, whatever you want, grind and grind it just to use. That's my suggestion. Even refrigeration or freezing it does not stop uh, entirely the oxidation. As soon as you break open the seed, uh, the the oil is exposed to oxygen. Now the question is, when it comes to that, how much to get the ALA? How much should a person consume of that? Like, like I know you said twelve hundred. Would you say grams a day of it or milligrams? Would you say uh, twelve hundred milligrams? One milligrams a grams. day. So how mm -hmm. much is twelve hundred milligrams? Just so we have an understanding: a tablespoon, a teaspoon, five once teaspoons. You, once you get the package, it it should say the amount of uh, omega three ALA right on the package per. It serving, says so. per serving, but if you're doing yeah, it it's, yourself, it's going to vary. It's going to vary depending on what it is. Uh, hemp has more than than uh, flax actually has more than chia or hemp. So, you know, it's a variation. Can you do too much? I know you can do too much of anything, but from an AOA standpoint, can you do too much like flaxseed powder? Uh, no, because the, the body will actually uh, store ALA for up to 12 months. So they did uh, uh, tracing where you uh, put a carbon isotope attached to it and find out how long it lasts in the body. So they found that ALA can be stored in fat tissues for up to a year. Uh, as a matter of fact, they found that up to 50 grams of DHA is stored in our fat tissues. <laughs> so this is pretty interesting because, you know, people say, oh, but our brain needs a lot of fat. Do you know how much? Most people have no idea how much DHA our brain uses. This is uh, astonishing because, uh, you know, most people, from what you're saying, that are using the chia pudding are wasting, from an ALA standpoint, are wasting their time. Uh, so here, here's... So the amount of DHA that the brain uses is 2.4 to 3.8 milligrams. Our body has 50,000 milligrams stored in its body tissues and fats at any time. So it's, it's not that we need to get them every day. It's, we do need to replenish them and we do need to consume them on a regular basis, but our body stores a lot. Of them. Would you be in agreement with me? Because from my observation, most vegans are not eating Black seeds, chia seeds, or hemp seeds, and and they're just not even thinking about it. 
And so if they're not eating these and even walnuts, let's say they're not eating these four things and they're on a vegan, are they putting themselves in danger or no? Some fruits and dark greens do also have a uh, dark greens are actually a pretty good source of, of the ALA, too. But again, you'd have to eat a lot of dark greens. And most people just aren't eating a lot of dark greens. <laughs> How about this question? If you take the chia seeds and you sprout them into microgreens, is that, that going to release them? It. Yes, That's correct. Unlocked. Then you can just eat them as they are. When I was a already... kid growing up, I remember chia pet. You know, it was like this pet. Yeah, Who knew that that was going to be like the, probably the greatest source for a vegan to cover this, right? Good source of protein, micronutrients, and also your omegas. Yes, now that unleashes the omegas. Just uh, the whole chia in their state or even their gelatinized state. I see so many people eating chia pudding. And it's like, okay, well, if you want to eat it just for this time, some of it is going to get crunched in your teeth and then released, but very little. Now, go back to your ahi flour powder. Or, or are they sub? No, they're oil, right? They come in an oil capsule. Yes, yes. If somebody has the actual flour, couldn't you yes. grow the flour? Like I grow food, can I grow the flour, or is it more complicated? You can, but like I said, remember the seed is where the oil comes from, just like a hemp seed, basically. Um, so, can you grind the seed and eat it if you were growing the flour? If you have the right equipment, the the seed hull is really really hard which is why it's called stone seed um so it's if you have the right machinery to to crack it open yes you could you could grow it and and consume it yourself i see okay so when people buy this product do they take it with food or without or how much do you recommend is it different for everyone or is there a standard amount that everyone should take it doesn't really matter um, because uh, omega-3 oils can be taken on an empty stomach or with food, just your own personal preference. Um, some people, because it is a fat and uh, by itself, um, do better, a little better when they're taking it with food. Um, but since, some people like myself, it, I, I can't tell the difference. So since you're not measuring your uh, your your EPAs through the, the blood, uh, is somebody going to see a difference or feel a difference when they're taking this, or they just know they're doing good based on everything we spoke about? Um, so when you take ALA, it converts to SDA and ETA. Those are the top three ones. If you take an EPA and DHA supplement, you're only getting the bottom three because it's a unidirectional conversion. It goes from ALA down to DHA. So if you take EPNA and DHA, you're getting no ALA, no SDA, and no ETA. Now, are those three important? An important study done using ahi flour because it produces so much of the first three omegas. And they found that those with the highest amounts of ALA, SDA, and ETA had higher fluid intelligence and higher gray matter preservation. More of the brain stayed. <laughs> and did, instead of brain shrinkage, which happens as we age, if we're not nutritionally getting sufficient amounts of omega nutrition. So EPA and DHA do help the brain, but so does ALA. ALA can be actually taken right up directly into the brain and converted to DHA in the brain, not just the liver. Um, so this is a direct amount. They found that ALA actually can convert to DHA right in the brain in the amounts that the brain needs for a daily basis. Um, so these things are important to know that taking an EPA supplement shouldn't matter one way or another. Uh, if you're consuming enough ALA, you're getting enough EPA, that's never been a question, that's never been in doubt. So EPA is not the issue, it's DHA. And does ALA convert to DHA? That was the only issue, now we know. Not only, yes, ALA does convert and way more than we even need. And two, taking preformed DHA can actually be harmful. I meant to say the ALA. So from what you've described before is does, so a person that takes a test, testing the yes. blood for the for all of these, if it comes out high or, or even average, that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, that could be a, uh, that could be a harmful because they, they're, they can, they're putting their heart in issues now. But if somebody comes out low, it could mean one or two things. Well, no, if you come out low, 
Yeah, it could mean one of two things. It could mean you're doing great because it's not getting in your blood and you're converting it, or it could mean you're not getting uh, enough. There's not even a way to determine. How would you test it to see if you're getting enough? They are working on a new uh, testing method. So one proposed method is once you uh, get ALA or um, DHA to the brain, it actually increases a thing called brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF. Okay, so BDNF is the cool chemical that actually re re you know, vitalizes our brain. It's what makes our, rebuilds our neurops, uh, synapses in our brain, the neuron connections, everything. So BDNF is a big deal for the brain. What you wanna do is elevate BDNF. It's not so much the DHA that's doing all the magic, it's that it's stimulating BDNF. Okay, so once the brain elevates BDNF, it seeps into the bloodstream and you can measure the BDNF in the bloodstream. So if you're getting enough DHA to the brain, you'll see BDNF show up in the blood. And that's an indicator. Here's an interesting study. They said, well, if that's the case, what if we put DHA from fish oil or, or um, algae oil in there, what happens? No increase in BDNF. Why? Because it's getting mopped up by the red blood cells. So the red blood cells are trying to take it out of the bloodstream and it's soaking it all up. Whereas ALA doesn't get mopped up by the red blood cells. It gets actually taken to the liver to the brain so it can be converted and used. When you consume only ALA, your BDNF goes way up, more than doubles. So we're seeing the effects of put in fish oil or algae oil, no increase in BDNF. Put in ALA um, or, or in its, uh, its plant-based uh, state, boom, ALA goes right through the, uh, BDNF goes up immediately. So that's an indicator. But they're working on a new study uh, that will test saliva because now we know that there are markers that we can measure for that says ALA has converted to DHA. And we can measure that and say, okay, that ALA is converting to DHA sufficiently. We don't have that test available. It's still in the testing phase, but hopefully that'll come out. The inventor of the omega-3 blood index, red blood cell test, the guy who invented it, his name is Bill Harris. He owns the company that makes the omega-3 blood test. It's called OmegaQuant. He came out after reviewing our, the research on eye flower and said, you're right, this is not measuring the health impacts of ahi flower. And it's inappropriate if you are taking ahi flower. He basically said the omega-3 index, the quote measurement for everybody to see if they're getting enough DHA is wrong, is false. It will give you the wrong information. Very interesting, very interesting. So, uh, and you said if somebody's getting it, we don't need much. So would somebody need to take this every day if they get this supplement or this whole food in the supplement form? Or is it something that they would take sporadically? The science is still not 100% clear on that. We haven't gotten it down that, but we're getting close. Um, I think with the help of ADI, uh, uh, AI rather, um, machine learning, computer learning, we can uh, develop some pathways, biological pathways that we can know that we can run the calculations and get this down to more in exact science. We're not quite there yet though. I'm an advocate for change, right? And because I care, I'm a, I'm a vegan for the animals. Uh, the reason I do this, the reason I've done eye flower is because fish are the most killed animal in the world. Two to three trillion fish are killed every single year for food. That's why I'm writing a book on omega-3 nutrition to show people you do not need fish or DHA to get all your needs because they are the most slaughtered animal in the world. I do all of this for the animals. Nature's wealth, good for your health. This is the Raw Life Health Show.